So we are recording this. We'll have this uh, presentation available to those that are interested in having it. I will share it with attendees just to let you know. And the slide deck will be available as well. So just to, uh, you know, kind of give you a little idea of the Meet the Buyer event. This is a quarterly event that we do here in Southeast Washington. My office is based in Kennewick, Washington. And our Meet the Buyer events, are just wonderful opportunities to bring together uh, very large government entities, representatives from procurement and management um, to share with our PTAC clients more about how to do business with their government entity. As many of you know, there are different methods of getting on vendor lists. There are different ways to market your, uh, your business and what you have to offer. And um, each and every one is, is unique in and of itself. There are some similarities, but we like to bring people in uh, that are involved in procurement and contracting <clears throat> and contract management. So they can share with you, um, you know, a little kind of an inside scoop on working with their particular government entity. And, um, uh, you know, also, I, I know a lot of people wonder if you're going to have access to all of this. You will have access to it. You will have some contact information to follow up with those involved with, uh, with the guests at the VA that we're talking with today. So we want you to just relax and sit back and bring, um, you know, bring your attention to the slide deck and all the information. There's going to be a lot of information shared today. You can take some notes and then I will definitely follow up with those that want some additional information a little later. So you can always reach out to me. Um, our special guests today are from the uh, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and they're going to share with us information about just basic, really what their mission is, what their goals are, how the federal government expects uh, them to, to work with the um, uh, individuals that have certifications, sometimes um, it's more advantageous if you are able to get your certification either as a veteran-owned business, service-disabled veteran, women-owned business, disadvantaged or hub zone certified. All of those certifications PTAC can assist you in at no cost and help with uh, your helping your understanding of how to get involved with government contracting. So I'll just hop through and kind of run through a few basic slides here about PTAC. Um, basically, PTAC was uh, a program that was started by the US government to provide liaisonship um, and one-on-one -on -one counseling guidance to small businesses that are interested in getting involved with government contracting. Um, we can assist you with finding bids, interpreting those solicitations, um, putting together your capability statement to um, help you market your business. And we also have post-award assistance and, uh, and actually a, a bid match service. That is, that is one that there is a, a fee for that service. However, you can try it out for about 30 days and see if you're finding that that service is helpful um, to find solicitations that are um, a potential match for your NAICS codes and the services that you provide. And there is $165 a year fee, which is very feasible for a tremendous amount of contacts and networking opportunities for you. Uh, we have eight regions within Washington covered by PTAC. PTAC counselors located within each of those. And the gold region that you see is uh, Southeast Central Washington is the region that I cover. And all of us in PTAC are in contact on a daily basis. So if someone that I work with in my region is interested in looking at solicitation, putting in uh, proposals for um, projects that, that you feel would be interesting in other areas of the state or in states outside of Washington, we can connect you with a PTAC counselor in that area to get guidance on uh, specifics that you have an interest in. In the slide, you'll see we have the contact information for all of the PTAC counselors throughout the state of Washington. Just to uh, let you know, there are some upcoming events. You can always go to our Washington PTAC website and take a look at the calendar of events and find um, um, other programs, services, trainings that you might be interested in. You can register through the website. It's been a, a different year as we all know, but it's actually been beneficial because folks can join in these virtual meetings from outside the region and not have to travel all the way to be there in person. 
Personally, I'm looking forward to being able to do my events in person with everybody at the chamber because I miss those one-on-one -on -one and seeing everybody. So, um, but right now it works, works pretty well. My next Meet the Buyer event will be doing business with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Walla Walla. That will be July 22nd. And if you'd like to mark your calendars and take a look at our calendar in the PTAC website, um, go ahead and register that. It is open for registrations at this time. With that, I'd like to move on with our special guest presenters from the Department of Veterans Affairs. We have Dale Allen, the Director of Contracting. We'll have Gary Nelson, Your Small Business Lies, on with the VA. Jacob Jackson, Senior Contracting Officer. And I believe we'll have Donna Mullen will join us toward the end for contract uh, information regarding construction in particular. So with that, I will hand it over to Dale if you'd like to take over for us. Uh, hi, Jody. Thank you so much for having us today. We really do appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we're, we're glad we could uh, attend and support with our team. Thank you. Um, uh, I've got a few slides. If, if uh, you, you already inter introduced me, I'm, I'm Dale Allen, and I'm the director here uh, up in NCO 20 Contracting. And uh, we've uh, got a good team of folks here with you. We're, we're, we're glad about. Next slide. So just, just a quick overview so you kind of get a, a picture of uh, where, we're, where we're at in, in the world. So uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs has three primary branches. Uh, that's the National Cemetery Administration, the Veterans Benefits Administration, uh, and then we fall under the umbrella of the Veterans Health uh, Administration. Uh, and within the Veterans Health Administration, uh, contracting is broken up into uh, three large regions. Uh, we have East, Central, and West. Uh, we're part of the West, and very specifically, we're NCO 20. We support Vision 20, and so we kind of uh, the the medical facilities within that region are the ones that we support. So Vision 20 is supported by NCO 20, um, and then if interested, there there is the uh, the flow down of our chain of command on the left side there. If you find that interesting, next slide. So uh, NCO 20 contracting office, who you know, who are we? Uh, we essentially support all of Alaska, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, we have in that area, we've got eight major medical facilities up in Anchorage, Seattle, Boise, uh, over the Portland, Vancouver, Roseburg, White City, Spokane, and Walla Walla. Really cool facilities that are spread out across the region uh, that do a lot of good work in the area. Uh, as a contracting office, we have four uh, sites uh, out in the field. We have 114 people that work uh, out of those offices. And uh, what do we what do we buy for the for the organization? I think uh, Gary might get into a little bit more specifics, but anything you can think that those facilities may need, uh, we essentially help them with. So all supplies, services, construction, uh, the some of the interesting things such as leasing and healthcare resources. All of those items come through our contracting office to support those facilities. Uh, what is our mission? Buying for those who secured our freedom. I, I really love that mission. I, I could really get my head around it. You know, recently we just came aware of a um, an action that they're they're working. It's a new stand-up for a pilot that they're working out of Puget Sound. They're calling it the Mobile Prosthetics Orthotic Care. Uh, uh, unit. And it's essentially a mobile prosthetics uh, lab that will go out to the out to the veterans home to assist them with their prosthetics. You know, I didn't think a lot of the uh, the program itself until recently some messaging went out that showed, you know, some of our leadership and some doctors actually out at one of those veterans homes. And um, it 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 brought me back to what we actually do in here uh, because one of the specialists who saw the news article was like, hey, I'm buying those vehicles. I'm helping to outfit that uh, van so that they can go out there and help those veterans. And so that's, that's what gets me excited. I love working for the VA and the fact that we get to be part of that uh, is extremely rewarding. Um, next slide. 
And just a couple of extra resources for you guys. I know I talked just briefly about our structure. There are some other buying agencies within the uh, VHA uh, umbrella. That's uh, the NAC, TAC, and SAC. We kind of uh, call them our alphabet soup of buying offices. Um, but they do help with some of our um, strategic sourcing and whatnot. And so if you're interested, those links are also being provided for you. Uh, I just had the job of giving you a little bit of an overview, so I'll let uh, I'll let my small business specialist uh, Gary Nelson kind of get into a little bit more of the technical. And so, with that, I thank you. And, and Gary, all you. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Jody and Jeanette for hosting this, and uh, Jake as well, and Donna for attending as well and answering questions at the end and presenting. Um, so we're going to jump right into the next slide and get started here. My little portion should be about twenty minutes. Um, so. Really, before marketing your company to a federal agency, you want to make sure the agency procures what you have to offer. The slide in front of you breaks down the spend by category, NAICS, and at the NCO20 and the station level for Walla Walla. At the VA NCO20 region, we procure approximately $500 million a year of goods and services. While our primary, our primary focus of spend is in the healthcare industry, we do procure goods and services similar to other agency, agencies to uh, keep our business operations running. Products like service, uh, products and services like equipment, supplies and material for facilities, MRO material, building construction, maintenance and repair, architect and engineering services, facility support, uh, temporary help services, logistics and delivery services, armored car services, groundkeeping, janitorial, and more. We also have a number of medical related fields with easier entry uh, than those highly specialized medical services and products like medical staffing solutions, ambulatory services, procurement of medical supplies and instruments and more. While our, our number one spend category is pharmaceutical preparation and manufacturing at the NCO 20 level, the, high, the next highest spend category is NAICS 236. This is general construction and it provides a tremendous amount of opportunity for small businesses. At the Walla Walla station level, Walla Walla obligations approx approximately 8 million a year. However, this data is uh, most likely only capturing approximately 85% of the obligations within that area and is slightly skewed because of the effects that COVID-19 had on daily operations. Due to how the VA records its funding stream in the federal procurement data systems, multiple funding streams may actually be captured at only one location. For example, if Walla Walla and Spokane decides to combine a station level requirements into one contract, Walla Walla may reimburse Spokane on the back end, but it could be reported that Spokane is attributed with the spend data. Additionally, there are other centralized or special funding streams like COVID-19, IT, and other large contracts not being recorded at Walla Walla Station, but being performed within its jurisdiction. During the beginning of COVID-19, early last year, it was like the Wild West for procuring PPE-related products. Procurement was decentralized, sources and availability of supplies was difficult to vet, and PPE vendors would uh, default on commitments to provide large orders. The acquisition of COVID-19 PPE material started to shift from the decentralized stations like the NCO20 level to the centralized NAC and SAC level, the National Acquisition Center and the Strategic Acquisition Center. This is why it's important not to just look at the Walla Walla area, but perform a macro search for opportunities and then narrowing your focus. Part of my job is to counsel uh, small businesses. And the first questions I ask are, what is your primary NAICS? And what uh, types of opportunities are you looking for? NAICS, uh, for reference, is North American Industrial Classification System. And it's the code that it really is the linchpin between uh, your company's industry and how the federal government categorizes that industry. Uh, the next question, uh, I ask what type of opportunities they are looking for. And then I'll look at the VA obligations for the past fiscal years and try and identify if and where this material is being solicited and procured from. It may be identifiable at the station level, the NCO level, or one of the larger acquisition centers we just discussed. The, uh, these questions and exploring the data can assist in assuring that the proper NAICS is being utilized by the vendor, help find the correct points of contacts, and form a strategic marketing plan and ensure the vendor is not spending a great deal of time and resources chasing a limited pot. So there's a lot of information there on the slides. Um, and this is for reference uh, when it's emailed out, you can sort through there. And if you have follow-up questions, just send me an email. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, this next slide illustrates who is winning the contracts within NCO 20 and at the Walla Walla station level. Within the federal procurement arena, there's a congressional mandate to serve small businesses first and then move towards full and open unrestricted competition. Later, if the small businesses cannot be identified. This mandate has created several small business and socioeconomic programs that affect the outcome of who wins a federal contract. Each agency may vary in their small business goals as they are negotiated with the Small Business Administration each year. Here at the VA, we have the Vet First program, which we'll talk more about in the next slide. However, you can see from the tables, service disabled veteran-owned small businesses, veteran-owned small businesses, and small businesses in general win a lot of the contracts. Currently at the NCO 20 level, we are green in each small business and socioeconomic program. Looking at the table on the left, the NCO 20 data, service disabled veteran owned small business fiscal year 21 goal is at 25%. We're currently sitting at 44.23%. For the veteran owned small business, that's at 27% for our fiscal year 21 goal. And again, we're exceeding that at 45%. The reason why veteran owned small business goals um, are higher and also the current uh, percentage. It's more of a counting uh, uh, trick. Uh, all SDVOSBs are VOSBs, but not all VOSBs are SDVOSBs. And so that's why you get those higher numbers there. Uh, for the small disadvantaged business, we have a goal of 5%. We're nearly triple that at 16.11%. For women-owned small business, we're exceeding it by a percent at 5.9%. And then for hub zones, which stands for historically underutilized business zone, we have a target of 3%. We're nearly triple that at 8.6%. And then small businesses in general, we have a goal of 50%. We're nearly 60% of all the federal procurement dollars for the NCO 20 being obligated towards small businesses. And then small dis disadvantaged business plus 8A goal of 5%, again, tr uh, nearly tripling that at 16.11%. Our competition level goals is at 70%, but our current percentage is just under that at 66.5%. Uh, While we do have a federal mandate to serve small businesses first, our second mandate is to find a fair and reasonable price to save the taxpayer money. And by striving for competition, this is one way to allow market efficiencies, e.g. lower prices. Um, looking at the table on the right, we have the Walla Walla station goals and current percentages recorded. Walla Walla is currently green in all categories besides hub zone. A hub zone and women owned small business can be a challenging goal to meet at times during the year due to the complex, complex and specific requirements coming out of the VA. The number of available hub zone and women owned small businesses in that industry and the hierarchy of small business programs, which we'll talk about in the next slide. All of these factors can have an effect on our hub zone and women owned small business goals. As you can see, uh, small businesses are winning most of the contracts, which is in the spirit of our congressional mandate to uh, support small businesses, and they are prominently winning them through competition. Uh, next slide, please. So before you jump into anything, it's important to understand the arena and specific regulatory roles you're about to participate in. A key to increasing your VA federal procurement readiness and opportunities is knowing and understanding the VA's regulatory arena. The Veterans First Contracting Program, also known as the Vet First Program, is established by 38 USC 8127 and 8128. It is unique to the VA and complements our mission to care for veterans. Within the US code, we have the rule of two. To better understand the rule of two, we must look at what is written in the code. The code specifically states, a contracting officer of the department shall award contracts on the basis of competition restricted to small business concerns owned and controlled by veterans. If the contracting officer has a reasonable, reasonable expectation that two or more small business concerns owned and controlled by veterans will submit offers and that the award can be made at a fair and reasonable price that, the offer, that offers the best value to the United States government. This is essentially establishes a hierarchy in the small business programs different than other federal agencies. This VET First program ensures veterans have the maximum opportunity um, to participate in VA acquisitions per Public Law 109, above all other small business concerns and large businesses. The VET First program, specifically the VA Rule of Two, has been challenged within the courts and made its way to, all the way to the Supreme Court. In 2016, the Kingdomware Technologies versus the U.S., the findings stated, uh, rule of two contracting is not limited to those contracts necessary to fulfill the uh, secretary's goals and additionally applies to all orders placed under federal supply schedules. 
What this means is the VET First program does not end after the goals are obtained, but must be followed through even after the goals are met. And any task order or delivery order written against an existing federal supply schedule must utilize the VA's rule of two. So this rule doesn't, uh, does not just pertain to new contracts being developed. The Kingdom Wear decision proved a major boon to service disabled veteran-owned small businesses and veteran-owned small businesses, ultimately resulting in billions of extra dollars flowing to veteran-owned companies. You can see how service disabled veteran-owned small businesses and veteran-owned small businesses exceed their annual goals, and it is due to this regulatory arena rules and process that directly attributes to the outcome. This also creates a tiered hierarchy of small business programs, which is essentially the first tier the first preference is service disabled veteran owned small businesses. The second is veteran owned small businesses. Next, we consider all other small business programs like HUBZone, 8A, women owned small business before moving unrestricted, full, and open. This is the pathway and process a CO must consider when procuring goods and services. In order to take advantage of the VET First program, a service disabled veteran owned small business or veteran owned small business must register with the Center of Vet, uh, Verification and Evaluation here at the VA. Uh, what this does is it opens up potential set asides and sole sourcing uh, contracting opportunities to vetted companies. Once registered in the program, the service disabled veteran owned small business and, or veteran owned small business will have a three year eligibility and certification that the company is indeed a service disabled veteran owned small business or veteran owned small business. Towards the end of the three year, the business will resubmit for certification. It is important to not let that certification lapse as it could affect current and future contracting opportunities. There are four stages to becoming certified through CVE and it typically, it typically takes about 23 days. The first stage is intake, the second is assessment, the third is a federal review, and the fourth is a decision. The documents required for intake assessment and review can be your license, your resume, tax documents, like the 1120 or 1140s, payrolls, signature cards, contracts, lease agreements, bylaws, articles of incorporation, shareholder agreements, minutes, stocks, uh, the main part of the vetting process is to ensure that the company is indeed controlled, managed, and has 51% ownership by one or more service disabled vet or veterans. Once completed and certified in the program, the company will be found in the vet biz directory. This directory is searched during the acquisition planning stages and increases the company's visibility uh, during the pre-solicitation performance of market research by contracting staff. It is anticipated the CVE program will move from the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, to the Small Business Administration sometime next year. This will allow for more integration among, among federal systems and consistencies with points of contacts and the application process. You can still do business with the VA as a small business or any other uh, small business administration, small business certification programs, but non-service disabled veteran-owned small businesses and non-veteran-owned small businesses do come in lower on the hierarchy of preference. One thing to consider for other programs is to ensure you stay up to date with the, the program rules. For example, the SBA recently amended 13 CFR 127, requiring women-owned small business concerns and economically disadvantaged women-owned small business concerns to be certified by the SBA to be eligible under the Women Owned Small Business Program for set asides or sole source awards. This is different than the previous third party certification process. The new and transitionary process will allow the contracting officer prior to award to verify the apparently successful offer and making sure they are certified and, in, in their, and it's noted in their SAM profile. If the apparently successful offer is a, um, under the economically disadvantaged Women Owned Small Business or Women Owned Small uh, business certification program is pending in their SAM profile, the contracting officer shall, shall notify the SBA's director of government contracting by email and request the SBA's elig eligibility determination. The SBA will pr uh, provide a determination regarding offer status uh, within 15 days. If the, offer, if the contracting officer does not receive a determination from the SBA within the, the 15 days, the contracting officer at their discretion may provide SBA additional time to make a determination or may proceed with award to the next highest evaluated offer. The contracting officer shall not make award to an offer who is not certified as a WSOB or woman-owned small business or economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business concern under, the, uh, under those programs. 
What this means is pending women-owned small businesses and economically disadvantaged women-owned small businesses can bid on solicitations, but um, on award, it cannot be made ent um, until they are certified under that small business program. And so it's important to stay on top of your application process. In review, the VA arena prompts the CEO and others to look at the available vendor pool, their eligibility, the capacities, and whether there is a reasonable expectation of receiving a fair and reasonable offer on a solicitation while moving down that small business hierarchy of preference. Next slide. Now that we have a rough idea of the regulatory rules, we want to look at how to increase your visibility and opportunities on winning a VA contract. The first thing you want to do is to make sure your company is visible and federal procurement ready. This includes your system of award management, your SAM profile, or registering with CVE and vet biz if applicable, but also partici participating in the pre-solicitation process. If you're waiting for the solicitation to be posted, you're already behind the, uh, the curve. By responding to RFIs, requests for information, and source thoughts, you can limit your competition based upon that hierarchy of preference. And this increases your chance of winning a contract. Participating in conferences like this one and sending your capability statements to me and other small business liaisons will also increase your visibility. I'm currently creating an internal vendor repository that will be a resource for procurement decision makers during the market research and requirement de the development stages where your company's products or services become more visible before a proposed procurement decision is made or a requirement defined. If you are not ready to be prime on a contract, becoming a subcontractor on federal contracts can be a great way to reduce potential risk by obtaining significant practical experience. You can learn the federal procurement process better by being an active member, meet key individuals, build relationships, and supply channels. There are a few areas you can look at for subcontracting opportunities. One is look at who the current holders of MATOX and SATOX, that's a multiple award task order contract and a single award task order contract with the VA and market directly to them. You can find this information by keeping an eye out on beta.sam.gov, searching through past award history or reaching out to the small business liaison to assist. Second, you can utilize the SBA subcontracting network, the subnet, or the GSA uh, General Service Administration subcontracting directory, or the Department of Defense's uh, subcontracting opportunity directory to search for opportunities. The links can be found in the additional resources slides at the end of this presentation. Third, utilize PTAC uh, for networking opportunities and marketing strategies. And fourth, contact the large businesses in the industry direct directory or directly build relationships with them and communicate your value. You kind of want to sell to your prime there. Let them know that you know your region and your customer, that you really have market acumen for the area, uh, you, that you can be competitive, that your back office has a, a mature staff, you have project management, a good reputation, et cetera. Remember how we talked about category spend by NAICS? This is important to ensure you have identified the appropriate NAICS to be registered within your online pro federal profile. I'm gonna repeat this because it's important. You wanna make sure you have the appropriate NAICS to be registered within your online federal profiles like your SAM, your vet biz registry. If you do not have the proper NAICS, then you are not visible during the market research uh, by contracting staff in search for uh, potential vendors. During my one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with small businesses, I find several of them uh, each month fail to properly identify the correct NAICS for their industry, products, and services. One way to ensure you're using the proper NAICS is to look through beta.sam.gov, active and historical, and find the solicitations you want to go after and look at what NAICS the agencies are utilizing. Put those NAICS into your profile so you can be found. Uh, joint ventures, team arrangements, and participating in mentor protege programs can be a great way to increase the resource capability of your small business as well. It allows one to compete for bigger opportunities or expand opportunities where highly specialized skills are required. It also promotes small business development. It leads to increased competition, innovation, and decreases contract risk. Uh, team arrangements can be informal, while joint ventures and mentor-protege programs are more formal and can require establishing a new legal entity and additional vetting by the SBA or VA. 
Uh, part of the additional benefits of joint ventures and mentor protege programs, however, are sharing additional resources, certifications, and some, in some instances, sidestepping affiliation issues where sharing loans, office space, et cetera, can be prohibited. Other resources like small business liaisons, advocate specialists within different regions of the VA or even different federal agencies can help assist in building your federal procurement readiness. Always make sure new and even established businesses utilize their local PTAC and SBA representatives. Taking the initiative and in learning the federal procurement process, understanding your market and building relationships is on the business owner. And there are a tremendous amount of governmental and non-governmental entities willing to help for free. Awareness of opportunities is key to finding work to keep your business running, but also to establish a pipeline of projects that will level off the peaks and the valleys of revenues you may face as a small business owner. This can also ensure you uh, can keep your staff active, while, uh, which would reduce the risk of employment attrition. As a former business owner, I searched for contracting opportunities daily and would fo focus on pipeline management. I would spend at least two hours a day re uh, researching what contracts were awarded, what contracts are on the street, and what pre-solicitations notices are out to try and become visible and limit competition. I was able to sole source negotiate over $4.6 million of contracts by being aware of opportunities before others knew of the requirements, building relationships with procurement decision makers, establishing a good rep reputation by performing quality work, and marketing my company in a way to solve the agency's needs specifically. By ensuring I was aware of upcoming opportunities, I was able to employ my staff uh, early on the projects to find hidden opportunities for efficiencies, where, uh, which were reflected in our proposals. Each agency and contracting officer may, procure a different, uh, may produce a different experience and outcomes as the agency's rules may vary uh, slightly, and the contracting officer may utilize their discretionary authority in different ways as well. Additionally, Search the VA's Federal Contracting Opportunities website to see what contracts may be coming up. Acquisitions um, that are made there, that make their way through our electronic contract management systems are posted on the FCO website. It is searchable so you can narrow it down to your field. But remember what we discussed earlier on starting from macro search and then narrowing down to a micro tactical search. Uh, existing contract set to expire is a good way. If you bid on a contract five years ago and you know it had a five-year life expectancy, mark in your calendar around that month or the month before uh, when that contract's going to expire. Keep an eye on beta.sam and also re-review how you proposed on, on that offer. Uh, there may be things that you missed, things that uh, you can go ahead and do better this time. So it's good to be uh, looking at existing contracts set to expire like those Maytox and Saytox as well. You can always ask. It never hurts to ask, but when you do, make sure you're uh, polite and succinct in your correspondence. You want to um, when you're, you you want to target the federal individual and not provide a mass email to everyone. Um, it, remember, it's continuously win, uh, continuously winning federal contracts is an active game. So you want to be active in your outreach. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, this next slide is to introduce OSDBU. OSDBU stands for Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. They manage the VET First program, provide acquisition support with market research, oversees contracting goals, monitors VA implementation of the socioeconomic small business programs, but also provides outreach, awareness, and training for small businesses and contracting staff. Outside of the SBA, PTAC, and the NCO Small Business Liaisons, OSDBU is a great resource to investigate for small businesses. You'll want to go to their website and explore the information, videos, and pamphlets they have provided. Uh, while there, take a look at their event schedule to find events where you can learn or present in front of the, uh, the procurement decision makers. Uh, that completes the VA Federal Procurement Readiness section. Now I'll hand it over to Jake, who is our Senior Contracting Officer with the VA, uh, to, uh, to complete the pre-solicitation uh, pre process from the point of view of a contracting officer. He'll also cover key points on the remaining cradle-to-grave contracting process before we open it uh, up for Q&A. Jake, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Gary. Um, Thank you. Hello, everyone. Just a little bit about me before I get started. Um, I'm Jake Jackson. I've been with the VA, specifically NCO 20 contracting for a little over 10 years. Um, I've done all sorts of things as a contracting professional, um, anything from procuring simple supplies such as vital sign monitors or CPAP machines 
to complex services such as patient transportation via both ground and air. Um, as Gary said, today I'm going to give you all a brief overview of what I do throughout the acquisition process, from receiving the requirement to performing market research, to solicitation, to evaluation, to award, to contract administration, and finally to contract closeout. So here we go. The first step in the, in the acquisition process is receiving the requirements package from the end users. And in most cases, we also receive the available funding that has been earmarked for that acquisition. In this phase, I serve as the business advisor to the end user or customer, and we work as a team to identify what type of contract vehicle and what type of procurement strategy best meets our needs. Once we determine what we require to meet our needs, we move into the market research phase to identify where and from whom we can acquire the required items or services. For example, are we going to utilize an established contract or solicit offers from the open market? Market research is one of the most important parts of the process as it ultimately steers the procurement and is required for all acquisitions. FAR Part 10 states agencies must conduct market research appropriate to the circumstances before developing new requirements and soliciting offers. The amount of market research performed is dictated by the complexity of the procurement, the estimated cost, and the availability of capable sources or contractors. As Gary already discussed thoroughly at the VA, we give preference to service disabled, veteran owned small businesses and veteran owned small business contractors. And if no veteran owned companies are available, we work through the small business hierarchy of preference. And finally, if no small businesses are available, we start taking a look at large businesses or soliciting our requirements on an unsolicited or an unrestricted basis, excuse me. In performing market research, we have several tools at our disposal. We review current and past procurements or acquisition history. We perform internet searches, including but not limited to sites such as veteran information pages or VIP, GSA Advantage Federal Supply Schedules, VA NAC Federal Supply Schedules, uh, another website, FPDS, which offers all current and past award information, including total contract award amount, we also utilize the Small Business Administration Dynamic Small Business Search Tool and even use Google or other search engines if we feel necessary. For supply buys or some maintenance services, we can reach out to the manufacturers to see if they have small business contractors that are authorized distributors of their products or authorized to repair or maintain their products. We can post sources SOP notices or requests for information and we'll let, in, in which we let the market talk back to us. And these notices will typically be posted to Beta SAM or GSA eBuy. In a nutshell, these notices will say something like, the Department of Veterans Affairs has a need for XYZ and is seeking capable contractors. Please provide responses and capability statements by this date at this time. We will then evaluate these responses to determine who can potentially meet our needs. And this, this is an important point, and as Gary discussed as well, it's in the, it's in the preloaded, the, the Q&A package you all receive. Um, but if you don't respond to these notices and you don't make yourself known, we may not know that you exist or that you're capable of meeting our needs. So I strongly encourage everyone to keep an eye out and reply to all of these notices in which your company is capable of successfully performing. And finally, we use the results of our market research to determine how the acquisition will be set aside and subsequently who will be provided the opportunity to participate in the solicitation process. Next slide, please, Jody. Once we have determined how the acquisition will be set aside using the results of our market research, we move into the solicitation phase. The FAR defines solicitation as any request to submit offers or quotations to the government. The solicitation will define the requirement, include any and all applicable clauses and provisions, the criteria on which offers will be evaluated, and the due date and time for offers. This is where the rubber begins to meet the road and we formally engage with industry. There are three, three major types of solicitations. We have requests for quotes or RFQs. RFQs are typically used in FAR 13 acquisitions, 
conducted using simplified acquisition procedures when the estimated amount of the contract is less than seven and a half million dollars. We also have RFPs or requests for proposals. RFPs are used to communicate government requirements to prospective contractors and solicit proposals. RFPs are typically used in FAR 15 acquisitions where the estimated amount is greater than seven and a half million. We also have invita invitation for bids or IFBs. And IFBs are referred to as sealed bid solicitations as there's there will not be any discussions or no negotiations following the IFB response. Key is that price is the key consideration during this bid process. And IFBs are typically used in acquisitions for upcoming construction requirements or projects. Solicitations are typically posted to betasam.gov, which has replaced FedBizOps and is the main government point of entry or GPE. Solicitations can also be posted to GSA eBuy, NASA Soup, and the vendor portal, which is for MATOC contract holders who perform construction requirements. Another option we have, if the estimated value of the acquisition is less than 250,000, we can also perform what we call oral solicitations, provided that we post a notice of intent to perform said oral solicitations to Betasam. We will then typically contact a minimum of of three contractors via email to solicit offers. During the solicitation phase, contractors are permitted to ask questions about the requirement and seek clarifications. We will answer all questions asked and if need be, post answers to questions not covered in the solicitation via, via amendment or sometimes even make changes to the statement of work or requirement if necessary. Once quotations or proposals are received and the solicitation, is period, the solicitation period is closed, we begin the evaluation process. Only responsive offers shall be considered for award. Responsive offers are offers that comply with all material aspects of the solicitation, follow directions within the solicitation, and are submitted on time. For example, if the solicitation specifically calls for information such as technical proposals, past performance references, acknowledgements of amendments, special standards of responsibility, et cetera, and you do not provide a complete response, your offer can be deemed non-responsive and your quota proposal will not be considered for award. Responsive offers will be evaluated in accordance with provision 52.212-2, which is evaluation of commercial items. This, this provision is contained within each individual solicitation and will state the evaluation factors and the basis on which award will be made. Typically, the evaluation criteria are tailored to meet the needs of each procurement and are not standardized. In different types of acquisitions, the relative importance of cost or price may vary. For example, in acquisitions where the requirement is clearly definable and the risk of and the risk of unsuccessful contract performance is minimal, cost or price may, pay, may play a dominant role in source selection. The less definitive the requirement, the more developmental work required, or, or the greater the performance risk, the more technical or past performance considerations may play a dominant role in source selection. As a, as a contracting officer, I thoroughly review each offer and then I send them for technical review by the end users who are, who are the subject matter experts to get their feedback and recommendations, which are also solely based on the criteria set forth in the solicitation. Once we have determined the best offer, I still have to determine the contractor to be responsible and determine that their proposed pricing is fair and reasonable. FAR Part 9.104-1 covers general standards of responsibility and states to be res responsible, a contractor must have adequate financial resources to perform the contract or the ability to obtain them, be able to comply with the proposed delivery or performance schedule, have a satisfactory performance record, have the necessary organization experience, accounting, operational capabilities and technical skills to perform the requirement and be otherwise qualified and eligible to receive an award under applicable laws and regulations. Special standards of responsibility, which are addressed in FAR 9.104-2, are included in the solicitation when it, has been, when it has been determined by the contracting officer and the subject matter experts 
that unusual expertise or specialized facilities are required for ad adequate contract performance. Two of the main tools we use in reviewing past performance and deter determining responsibility is the Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System, or FAPIS, and the Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System, or CPARS. These are both databases that contain reports on contractors' performance on an annual basis for contracts with an aggregate value of over $250,000. My main advice when it comes to responsibility matter, matters is to not leave question unanswered. Make sure when preparing your offers that you address all requirements stated in the solicitation and put your best foot forward, showing and proving to us that you are capable and responsible. It is also important to note, if a contracting officer deems a small business non-responsible, we are required to refer the matter to the Small Business Administration which allows the, the business to petition for a certificate of competency or COC. The SBA, the SBA will then determine whether or not the referred company is to be considered responsible or not and decide whether or not to issue a certificate of competency. In most cases, a company that fails to receive a certificate of competency will no longer be eligible, will be considered eligible for contract award. Determining proposed pricing is fair and reasonable is a very important step in the evaluation process as one of our main responsibilities as contracting professionals is to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. We are required to ensure the government is attaining the best possible value for money spent. In determining the, pros, the proposed pricing fair and reasonable, we have many different methodologies available for use. If we are purchasing from an established contract such as a GSA federal supply schedule, this, term, this determination is fairly straightforward as the items and services offered under each schedule have already been determined fair and reasonable at the time of schedule award. If we are procuring from the open market, it is always best to base this, this determination on competition or comparison of the offers received that are responsive and meet our needs. If only one offer is received, a few options we can base this determination on are market research, comparison of the proposed price with prices found reasonable on previous purchases, and comparison with similar items or services in a related industry. Quick comment and something to remember is that award is not always to the lowest price offer. So please remember to pay extra special attention to the evaluation criteria stated in the solicitation and provision 52.212-2. Next slide, please, Jody. Once we have determined which offer is selected for contract award, we prepare the contractual doc document and obligate funding. We then notify the successful officer offer that they have been selected for award and in most procurements, not utilizing simplified acquisition procedures, we also notify the unsuccessful offers that they were not selected for contract award. Contractors can accept award in two main ways. The first, by signing the contract or standard form 1449 and returning to the contracting officer, or by com commencing performance of the contract. In some cases, the decision to hold a post-award conference is made. A post-award conference generally has five main goals, which are to clarify procedures to facilitate award implementation, to detail the more critical or complex requirements of the award and ensure understanding, to invite questions from the awardee regarding any requirements that they need clarification on, to clarify the roles that key personnel will play in award implementation, and lastly, to identify and resolve potential issues. Next slide, please, Jody. Once a contract is awarded, we still work closely with the contracting officer's representative or core and the contractor to monitor performance. Contract administration in simple terms involves the management of risks. Its basic purpose is to monitor performance to ensure the objectives of the contract are met on time and within the intended budget and also to detect any deficiencies and find a remedy. Some examples of tasks performed during contract administration are address and document poor contract performance, which can be done by means of counseling, 
can also be done by contract discrepancy reports or cure notices, and can ultimately result in termination of the contract if the issues are not remedied. We also monitor milestones or progress schedules outlined in the contract. We certify and pay invoices according to the contractual terms. We hold meetings with the contractor and other stakeholders. We can make changes to the contract via contract modification unilaterally, which are only signed by the contracting officer and include making administrative changes, issuing change orders and exercising options. We also can perform bilateral modifications, which require the agreement and signature of both parties and are used to make negotiated equitable adjustments, increasing or decreasing work within scope, and formalize any other agreements of both parties modifying the terms of the contract. We also, during the lifetime of the contract, perform interim performance evaluations and document them in CPARs. Next slide, please, Jody. A contract closeout occurs when a contract has met all of the terms of a contract and all administrative actions have been completed, all disputes settled, and final payment has been made. This includes all administ administrative actions that are contractually required. Some examples of tasks associated with closeout are settling disputes, issuing final payments, obtaining operation and maintenance manuals for a system that was developed or equipment that was provided, obtaining patent rights or licenses for inventions or software that was developed, and also the final CPARS evaluation in which we document the contractor's performance over the whole span of the contractual period. Successful performance is key to being eligible for future contracts with the government and as discussed earlier, we rely on that information contained in FAPIS and CPARS when we're determining contractor responsibility and reviewing their past performance. And that's all I have, folks. Um, feel free to ask any questions during the Q&A period, and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Jake. Uh, before we open up for questions and answers and comments, um, if you have a capability statement, please send it to me at gary.nelson, the number one at va.gov. Uh, we briefly talked about capability statement. It is kind of, kind of like your business resume. Um, PTAC can assist in developing a, you know, the best in class uh, capability statement for you. But some things to make sure that you have in there is your past performance, your DUNS number, any small business um, program certifications like SDVOSB, Women Owned Small Business, HubZone, 8A, et cetera. And it's reflected in your SAM profile. And then you want to make it consumable within six seconds, visually at least. So the uh, individual reviewing it has a good understanding of what you are, what you provide. You want to show your value. Value. You want to prove it with your past performance, make yourself equal or greater than the competition, and then dif differentiate yourself by taking control and showing your knowledge and understanding about the field. Uh, again, PTAC SBA is a great resource and make sure your capability statement is in line with your uh, small business profile with the SBA. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, Donna Mullins is a senior uh, contracting officer in construction here as well. And so if there's con uh, construction specific questions, we'll open it up for Donna. Jake uh, provides uh, expertise in service and material acquisitions. Myself will be in the pre-solicitation process and also uh, VA federal procurement readiness, business development, marketing, and increasing your visibility, networking. And then Dale is great for um, everything really, you know, he, you know, he's our director of contracting, very knowledgeable, and uh, especially about the framework and interrelationship uh, between the VA structure. Uh, with that, are there any questions? I haven't seen any pop up in the chat. I think people were uh, really focused on what you were presenting. We'd like to open this up now. If someone has a specific question or idea or want clarification, unmute yourself and speak up. Introduce yourself, what company you're with, and what your question might be. Hey, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. This is Carlos Calabro with 3DI. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Thank you, Carlos. Hey, I apologize. I came out towards the tail end of this. I had a little bit of a conflict, but I wanted to try to catch as much of this as I could. So, uh, Gary, first, thank you so much for providing your contact information and sending the capability is in regards to sending the capability statement. Uh, the, the, the one main question I have for you, um, and it's different from 
it seems like from one uh, you know federal agency to the next is in regards to uh, organizations like us that provide IT services. Um, is that something that you are uh, entertaining in regards to obtaining these capability statements from IT services companies like 3DI? I, sometimes they have different contract vehicles that they use in regards to as compared to constructions or their definition of goods and services. So I just wanted to make sure that um, there's still an opportunity for an organization like us that provides IT services to different cities, counties, state agencies, federal agencies that you are accepting that type of information as well. Yeah, definitely send me your information. IT is usually procured at the centralized area, like we we're talking about the NACSAC, TAC, the National Acquisition Center, the uh, Strategic Acquisition Center, and then the Techno technology acquisition center that's going to be where you, you're going to want to market your your company however if you send me your capability statement i'll translate that into our searchable directory for our small business vendors uh repository area and what that does is we'll get your information out in front of other procurement decision makers and possibly uh clinician staff and so the customers to the va you know the the internal people will be able to see your information and then help work on de uh, developing that requirement or maybe reaching out to you but um definitely it's going to be at the the TAC level is who you're going to want to market for a, a, a non-decentralized uh, centralized approach gotcha so very much appreciate that feedback. Um, I'll definitely get that to you. I know that folks like you are the ones that at least give us an opportunity to let people know that. I always joke around and tell people we're, a lot of times we're the, the best IT services company you've never you've never heard of. So it's just one of those things where uh, the, hopefully the greasy wheel uh, gives us the opportunity to at least let people know that we exist. Yeah, thank you. That's a good approach. You know, making sure you're visible is reaching out to small business liaisons and even the acquisition centers have their own uh, small business liaisons that you can reach out to as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And Carlos, remember, if you have a capability statement that you think is ready to roll, feel free to send that to myself or the PTAC counselor that you work with directly in your region. And uh, we're more than happy to review that capability statement, provide feedback, make sure your next codes are correct. PSCs, all those things to be sure that you are ready when you uh, when you send that in so you don't miss an opportunity. You know, that's a great idea. Thank you. I know that our marketing team is in the process of just doing a little bit of uh, um, refreshing in regards to our capability statement, but mm -hmm. it would be great once they get that to me that I forward it to you guys and have you let me know if if we're on track, if we're like totally sucking when it comes to providing the right information or if if you if you have any recommendations that you could give that would at least mark the trigger so to speak of cust you know, prospective customers that would look for services like ours mm -hmm. that's great thank, thank you. you so much thank you carlos who else has a question or a comment like to unmute introduce yourself to your company the kind of things you do and what question you may have for our presenters today Hey Jody, this is Jake. I had a just one one tidbit to to add to Carlos's question. And Carlos, I don't I, I don't know the complete capabilities of your company, but I I encourage you to look into NASA Soup. Um, that's a huge database where it's similar to uh, say a federal supply schedule, but it deals only you know it's predominantly for the sale or the purchase of IT equipment. But they're also they also offer you know installation services of these systems and things like that. So definitely check that out too if 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 you feel necessary. And I'm sorry, who was that speaking again? Uh, my name is Jake Jackson. I'm a contracting officer. Jake, no, thank you. Uh, you said it's the Na the the NASA Soup. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a database ran by NASA, and I believe it's Solutions for Enterprise Wide Procurement. So it's S E W P. Mm -hmm. Hey, Carlos. Okay, uh, just so you guys know, I will follow up after this. I'll be sending a plethora of information with some of the most frequently asked questions, and that soup S E W P. The information about that will be included in the document that I send to you following the event. No, I appreciate it. No, we, we, we do focus a lot on uh, IT services, not necessarily hardware uh, reselling, so to speak. So we do everything from IT staff augmentation to systems upgrades to systems integration. 
uh, website redesign and development. Um, one, I think our biggest client, at least in the federal space, is uh, the, the Securities Exchange Commission. Unfortunately, we have to do it by way as a subcontractor um, because of contract rules and, and whatnot, but um, um, we do like 90% of all the technical work. Uh, we've had a, a contract with them for about five years now. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that would be fantastic. Uh, we're just, we're, we've, we've worked a lot with cities and, and counties and state agencies over our 25 years. Um, federal, federal space is, I, I don't want to say it's a relatively new one because we've been there for about five years, but we, um, we're still learning how to uh, do business better in the federal space. It's an ongoing process. <laughs> thank you, Carlos. And thank you, Jake, for um, filling in that for me. Is there any other questions, comments? See, Jerry, I see you're unmuted. Would you like to ask a question or introduce yourself? Jerry Samoska? Not quite. Who else has question, wants some clarification, or if you'd simply like to let our presenters know who you are and what you have to offer and your interest in being here today. Kind of a quiet group. I always have a hard time believing that you don't have questions, so <laughs> I'll give it a second and have somebody think about what you're wondering. And uh, let's see, I do have Paul McHugh wrote a note in the chat box. It could be he can't get uh, can't get unmuted. We'll find out. Paul says, my name is Paul McHugh. I'm a business developer with Porter House Incorporated. We're a woman-owned small business in the consulting, staff augmentation, and private propri proprietary post-secondary training industry. Any feedback or ideas, Gary, or one of the other presenters for, yeah. for Paul? Yeah, Paul, if you send me your capability statement, I'd um, like to review where you're at on your development area there and uh, see where you're with the federal registries and see uh, where your VA federal procurement readiness is. Uh, one thing that I do is one-on-one -on -one counseling, at least a dozen a week, where we review your capabilities and how to increase your VA federal procurement opportunities to align the NAICS and looking over through the spend obligations and looking at a strategic and tactical approach on how to market. Um, so if you reach out to me, send me your capability statement, that's a good way for me to at least get that in initial look over in your company. And then we can target a 15, 20 minute, 30 minute uh, session to see how we can expand your opportunities and um, probabilities of winning a contract. That's great. He also mentioned that he doesn't have access to a microphone on the desktop. So he did uh, add one more comment that they have a number of technology schools um, Sorry, I need to bump this back up a little. Number of technology schools that are currently GI Bill approved and they're looking for ways to market their business in this region. So it'd be really good if, uh, uh, Paul, if you can send your capability statement uh, into Gary or if you aren't sure how to do that, contact me and we'll be sure to get you guys connected. Hey, this is Carlos again on 3DI. Uh, am, I, am I allowed to ask so, another question? So Jerry Samoska, his idea of Absolutely. Oh, hey, this is Carlos again. So I, I do have a sure. quick question. Is that Carlos? Yeah, this is Carlos. I'm the greasy wheel again. I apologize. I usually have plenty of <laughs> ones, but... Uh, but I did have a question for you, especially in the in the kind of the federal space here. Um, so at one point, um, 3DI uh, did have our 8A status. Uh, we did graduate from that. Um, is there uh, is there a way that uh, that were, place where I can go to get maybe a little bit more educated in the fact that obviously there's small business certification, and then there's also your 8A, I guess, certification status. Now that we've graduated from the 8A piece of the equation, I'm trying to figure out from a in the federal space how we still leverage our small business status uh, in, in regards to responding to potential opportunities, at or at least making them aware that even though we're not 8A anymore, but we are still small business. Are they able to take advantage of that check mark in regards to 3DI and, and utilizing a company like us 
uh, that can provide those services. And when I do know that a lot of these federal agencies do have a, I hate to use the term quota, but you know they do they do have an incentive to use small business entities for doing work for them. Yeah, so there's a couple of things I'd comment on. Um, at the beginning of the slide, we have 38 USC 8127. Section H is going to give us our hierarchy of preferences for small business concerns. Currently, 8A is on the third tier. So first is SDVOSB, the uh, Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business. That second tier is going to be Veteran-Owned Small Business. And that third tier is going to have 8A in it. So um, since you already graduated, I'd reach out to the SBA and maybe look at some 8A mentor, uh, mentor-j protege program, mentor-protege programs. That be, be, could be a good way to get back into that 8A program as a mentor, right? And um, since you graduated from that program, I think that opens that up to you. Uh, in regards to marketing your other small business uh certifications or programs that you're a part of. You just want to make sure your SBA profile is up to date, that the NAICS, when you scroll down into your profile, that the NAICS also represent small business. And it's also in your capability statement. Again, refer back to that 38 USC 8127 section H, because the CEOs do use that a hierarchy of preference to process uh, and looking at the responses to their offers to either do set-asides or uh, move towards full and uh, open unrestricted competition. Gotcha. And the, and that's in the slides that were provided. And again, I apologize. I, I missed the first part of today's session. It, will these slides be available for me to be able to review? Absolutely. I'll send them out to all of the participants today. I'll send that plus all of the FAQs with answers and links to a lot of information you can use to follow up that, uh, that Gary and all our presenters talked about today. You get yep. many pages of information. There's and about four, 14 pages and it's really going to really cover you know where the best for federal procurement sites are for where we post solicitations informations and then how to you how we navigate the federal um, arena with the regulations and the processes so between the slides in that 14 page document and the additional resources uh, in the slides after this uh, question and comment area if you don't have an answer your answer there feel free to reach out to me and, and i'll work to uh, answer it no thank you thank you both so much i will uh i will try to control myself from asking any more questions. Thank you. <laughs> now, this is a good time to ask questions when you have the presenters right here to answer what you need. So who else has questions, comments, or would like to share who they are and what they do with our presenters today? If you don't have, uh, don't have audio, feel free to type it in the chat box and we'll message that out for you and get some answers. Hi, Amy. I see you joined us today. Thanks for being here. Do you have any questions for our presenters at all, Amy? I'd like to share with them what you do and what you're interested in doing. Ooh, a shy group today. Is someone that has a phone number ending in 3611, I'm not sure who that is, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, share with us your interest in VA today? Yeah, my name is uh, Kurt Schneider and um, I own Kurt? a company called Solar Mobility. Hello. I'm curious uh, to know more about the Group 2 mobility contract, the 62F. Yeah, that's... Um something that's come up a, a couple of times in the last month. And it's something that if you send me again, your capability statement and your specific questions regarding it, whether it's coming out for solicitation, whether you want to participate in that, uh, let me know. And then I'll also review where your company's at in its current status. And then we'll get you that information. Um, additionally, um, with kind of what, what you're providing, we're gonna have a November industry day here at the VA. And so it's really important if you wanna participate and get your information, your products, your industry information, present yourself in front of procurement decision makers, send me your information and we'll, we'll try and get something set up in November. That will also increase your visibility here locally. And then we'll approach the strategic uh, area for uh, the large acquisition centers and seeing how you can market yourself directly to them to get into that program. Okay, well, we're a sole source, uh, basically, Ameri well, we're almost completely American-made product, solar, 
uh, green product. So I think in this time age right now, we probably hit all the bells and whistles for the government's acquisition. Yeah, there's a couple different resources that you could use outside of the mobility too, is uh, directly working with TRICARE and then the Community Care Network. And so that's some areas that we can also explore as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, hey, I'd like to introduce, oh, I'm sorry, were you finished, Kurt? No, this is Carlos. I'm breaking my promise. Is that November day uh, live or is that virtual? It, at this time, it's going to be virtual, and it's, we're still setting up the framework, so we don't know if we're going to do Microsoft Teams, WebEx, or another hosting service, and then we're looking at the structure, whether it's going to cover a couple days, and also each day is going to cover a certain industry, and it, it is going to be limiting seating and opportunity to present in front of the individuals, so it's going to be uh, really making sure that you present yourself self well in your capability statement, really target your capability statement on how you'd want to present in that November, and then we're going to sit through there to to find um, those that can host in front of that event. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce Talia Ochoa. She is with uh, with our sponsor, the Washington River Protection Solutions. Talia, are you able to unmute and chat with us? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Talia Ochoa. I'm the Small Business Program Manager for um, Washington River Protection Solutions. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Talia, it's a little bit difficult to hear you. Can you chance you get a little closer to your mic for us? Yeah, sorry about that. Is that better? It's okay. A little bit. A little bit, okay. Uh, my name is Talia Ochoa, and I'm the Small Business Program Manager for uh, Washington River Protection Solutions. Um, I don't have any questions for you today, but I think this has been a really informative uh, uh, really informative meet the buyer. I really enjoyed all the things that you've had to share. And um, I think all the counseling that you offer as well for small businesses, it's a really great resource. Yeah, it's um, something that when I was a small business owner and became SDVOSB and HubZone certified, uh, re really reaching out to see what resources are available, starting with SBA and PTAC. Uh, Tiffany Scrog uh, Scroggs uh, was one of my main point of contacts back in 2008, 2009, 2012 area, uh, where she really helped uh, gain my federal procurement awareness and understanding. And so I like to give back, you know, as a former business owner, going through a grad program that focused on federal acquisition regulation, CO discretionary authority, and as a formal, uh, former uh, contracting officer myself, it's, um, I really find great uh, deal of pleasure in helping other people succeed and increasing their opportunities as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot to know. It's a, it's a big, big body of water of information to wade through. Yeah, it's so. like drinking out of a, a you know, a, a, a fire hose at times where uh, sometimes it takes, uh, you know, an iterative approach on understanding acquisition uh, regulations and then the different agencies and the process, the rules, the, the players involved, how, you know, how to, uh, uh, you know, submit your offers. And so what we try and do is, you know, we'll hit them a lot up front get that information and then we'll start pulling out more questions and answers uh, specifically maybe individual counseling sessions or email correspondence and then we also provide uh, like Jody said um, probably about 40 pages between the PowerPoint slide and uh, the pre-submitted questions and answers um, for additional follow-up. Mm -hmm. Wow that's amazing well thank you for what you're doing and uh, thank you for the information today. Thank you Talia. Thank you Talia. Again, she's with Washington River Protection Solutions, who are our sponsors for the Meet the Buyer events. They are very strong supporters, and she and I, like many of the other small business uh, contract managers, um, are, we are attached at the hip. We are in constant communication, and uh, I think we'll be doing that even more with Gary and his crew, too. Thank you so much. Who else has any questions, or would you like to introduce yourself, share with us what your business does, and your interest in working with the VA? Feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Do you have Amy? We haven't heard from Amy or Stephanie Ward. Would you like to chat with us today? Introduce yourself. Shy group. Let me give you one more shot or we'll give you a little additional 14 minutes to your day. Anyone else have anything else they'd like to share? So Gary, I'm gonna check um, 
You know, one, one thing I think it might have been Jacob that mentioned in the in the procedures and, and making sure that you're a viable um, option with regard to a business that might work with VA. I think Jake, you mentioned that if someone does not um, does not complete the application or, do, or misses a piece that gets to you that they will not be considered for further contracts. I want to be sure I understand. Does that mean that they could kind of be almost like be banned from, um, you know, putting in a, a response to a solicitation because they made one mistake or is that something they could get feedback from the VA and uh, improve and maybe do better next time? Did you clarify that for us? Yeah, thanks, Jody. No, my, my intent of that statement was not that that they would get, you know, banned or discouraged for participating in future procurements. Mm -hmm. um, I believe what you were getting at is my blurb on um, responsiveness. Mm -hmm. So responsiveness is different from responsibility. Um, but absolutely, I mean, if, if we find ourselves in that boat, um, we're more than willing to, to provide feedback. Gary would be a great resource for that, but absolutely not is the intent to, you know, bar someone from participating in acquisitions just because they they made mistakes in, in regards to one procurement. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be sure that our clients understood very clearly that um, there can be situations where you can get some feedback and improve to do to do better, but responsiveness is, is a key uh, aspect of what you do in, in your recruitment process and follow-up. So I appreciate you clarifying that for us. Thank you. Yeah. And a, a, another part of that is, you know, if, if we do get it, if you, if you do get a contract award and your performance is not up to snuff and we have a lot of issues and, in resulting in a contract termination or something like that, that, that action is a permanent blemish on your record um, mm -hmm. in CPARS and FAPIS. And that's stuff that we take into account when we're, when we're looking at the responsibility aspect, not the responsiveness. Um, if we go in and we look up your company and we find that you have a bunch of blemishes on your record, you know, we might determine that doing business with you is, is too risky for the government. Um, so if, if you find yourself in that situation, yes, I mean, the Mm -hmm. that that could prevent you from getting future business absolutely mm -hmm. agreed and i think something that i constantly remind my clients too is be very sure that if you make a commitment to work with the federal government be it the va or any other federal entity make sure that you present and represent yourself and your company appropriately. Don't fudge any answers. Don't say, yeah, I think I can do this and find out maybe you don't have the staffing capabilities, the time, if not financially stable to get that job done and handle the payment, uh, um, you know, the, the program. And uh, I think there are just some things that people, they're so excited to have an opportunity with a federal entity like this and they want to dive in and show that they have it, but that can be detrimental. And maybe Gary or someone can clarify if they are not fully capable of following through with their commitment. Once they sign on, you have to perform and report correctly. Gary, you wanna elaborate on that for us a bit? Yeah, there's a, just from, you know, my time being in the federal arena, it's, especially as a private business owner, you it's a lot of times you want to be like, I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. And you market yourself as the guru of providing all products, services, construction, engineering, consulting, and all that stuff. And, and even today, when I counsel small businesses, you know, they're in, you know, airline aviation products is, and then they're also pro uh, providing additional things like, um, like PPE gloves, right? That's a big thing that's happened over this last year. Um, companies saying that they're capable of providing, you know, 15 million sets of gloves and stuff like that. And then when we award a contract and then it comes time to deliver, you know, they they provide 35,000 pairs of gloves. And so then we're forced to cancel the co contract and then we have to go back out. And it provides a lot of additional administrative burden onto the VA. And then, so when if you do that and get into that situation, it's, it's not gonna look good. And then to speak on that, 
if you're gonna provide services to our products to the government and uh, like medical devices and supplies and um, tools and stuff like that, you wanna make sure that you're an authorized distributor of that product, that you have that letter from the manufacturer. And then uh, you understand the non-manufacturer role, how that applies, making sure that, you know, there's four requirements on that, that your company under 500 employees or 150 for IT. And then also looking out if that manufacturer is a large or a small business, because that's going to affect the process that the CEO is going to have to vet your company and making sure that you provide that as a normal retail service of your company. Like I said, going back, if you're aviation selling PPE stuff, that may not uh, come off it. That, that's going to raise a yellow flag once the CEO is reviewing your offers and stuff like that. And then uh, additionally, that the product's made in the US or at least has a class waiver. And you could go to the SBA for that. Um, so when you target your you know, marketing approach to the government, make sure that you're, you're very tactical in it rather than just macro based. This is all the things I can offer you, you know, like the one stop solution to all your problems that doesn't come off too well. Mm -hmm. Well, and you remember that and that gets communicated throughout the procurement staff. So, uh, you know, you don't, you just don't want to get yourself in that situation. Although I know, you know, this year has been a good example where there have been some interesting situations with regard to shipping and receiving, um, perhaps not the fault of the, the contractor. It could be they had a written guarantee from the manufacturer, from, uh, uh, you know, the, the large scale that's going to provide that. And then something happens outside of their hands. It's my understanding that, that the contractor or sub needs to make immediate contact with the contracting officer and not to elaborate, make big mistake errors in your communication, but to be succinct and let them know an issue has come up. Here's our plan to handle it. Here's the time frame that I am able to complete uh, our, our requirements and, and follow through and talk direct with the CEO so they know. In a case like that, doesn't that help maintain their reputation and just understand something really strange has come up and we are working to resolve the issue? Yeah, I mean, there's going to be, uh, you know, hurdles in each contract. It, you know, contracts don't go 100% smooth all the time. And so to really have that good relationship is to have a good dialogue and communication available, uh, letting the CEO understand risks that are coming up rather than hiding them. Um, I've had, you know, vendors that hid from me for months and <laughs> trying to get a hold of them where we're about to, you know, uh, close out their contract. And then eventually we, you know, we started opening that dialogue with them and worked on some project management skills, some communications, you know, added a couple additional event schedule clauses and, and got things planned out. We're not in the business of putting small businesses out of business, right? We want to work with them because, and we want to develop them um, as a, their capabilities and uh, opportunities increase because that's in our best interest as well you know we're not here just to um, get the lowest price and then uh, you know find the gimmicks on our end to even get it lower at the back end it's really a partnership once we sign that contract and part of that is going to be communication exactly thank you jacob do you have anything to add to that harry actually stole the words out of my mouth um, when he said <laughs> we are we are not in the business of putting small businesses out of business um, that's that's a great point. Um, and we're reasonable. I mean, these these same delays we we see in government procurement are the same delays we go through in our personal lives. I mean, I, I recently waited for two months to get a, a special set of tires I wanted for my wife's car. I mean, we get it. Um, and we have so many different options for, you know, resolving disputes. Um, and I've actually only ever really come down hard on a company probably once or twice in my career we really try to work together as a team and find alternative solutions to resolve these disputes instead of just dropping the hammer um mm -hmm. so i mean and like like you said jody i mean when stuff comes up don't hide it from us that that just digs that hole deeper just be just be open and honest and mm -hmm. and in most cases we're gonna work with you i mean we we get it so Mm -hmm. um, don't be bashful. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Appreciate that. So we give it one more chance. If anyone else has any questions, comments, you want to market yourself to uh, these fine gentlemen right here and right now, here's your opportunity. If you'd like to speak up and let us know a little bit more about yourself. 
Jody, I'm the worst. I'm the worst at keeping my promise. This is Carlos again. I like it, Carlos. You can join me anytime. I, I do have a quick it. I do have a quick question just in regards to accepting experiences and references. Um, Gary, I, I, I'm sure it's safe to say, and you know this for a fact, that not all federal agencies are created equal. And some do like specific experiences and uh, references in the federal space. Um, is Veterans Affairs, are they open and receptive to the fact that a company like mine, who's worked in public sector for 25 years, probably the greatest thing I can tell anybody on this phone here is we have never lost a customer, um, which is hard to do um, unless you're doing things right. But it's safe to say that we've done a lot of a lot of our experience has been in the cities, counties, and state agency arena. We we do have some limited experience in the federal space. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so my question to you is, when it comes to opportunities that come up, and they're looking for folks that have references or experience in these specific areas of need. Is the VA open and receptive to that type of experience that may come outside the federal space, whether it be in cities, counties, or state agencies? Yeah, I'll start answering this and then I'll pass it over to Jake, see if he has anything else he would like to add. But um, it really depends. There's a very logical approach and then there's going to be a relationship you're building up with the CO. So from a logical approach, it's, they're going to be looking at, you know, the CPAR is your uh, past performance on federal, um, you know, contracts. If you don't have any, then it's going to be looking at what your commercial, uh, you know, experience is going to be. Is it similar to the requirement? Then they're going to take a look at the requirement, the complexity, the risks associated with it, the security and, and stuff like that that's attached to that technical aspect. Aspect. And then they're going to look at your company, uh, what certifications you have, um, you know, like your electrician, or if you're IT, do you develop within the uh, kind of that software coding program? I can't remember what they call it. Um, or also, you know, how do you, and then the additional IT information aspects of it for warranties and development and, and so on for a patent technology. And um, are you able to you know, provide that additional commercial or COTS warranty and services that comes with the, you know, those other players in the IT world that, you know, are going to provide it through their companies. So they're going to be looking at you comparable, and then they're going to also look at, you know, do they feel comfortable with um, reviewing your company is that you're going to provide a, a fair and reasonable price or and an acceptable offer if they have reasonable expectations on that then they're getting they're probably going to step forward with that so there's that technical aspect about it and then there's kind of that discretionary authority that the contracting officers have to help mitigate risk to the federal government Thank you, Gary. I'm going to just send one little quick message out to Dale, Dale Allen, Director of Contracting. Do you have any final comments uh, or suggestions for our crowd today that you would like to share with us? Uh, thanks. Uh, hey, I, I do believe in the attachments of this uh, presentation, there's quite a few resources in there. And uh, I'd really encourage you guys, uh, as, as you uh, get a chance and you get these slides, to really take a look at some of those resources. One of my favorite resources that uh, I always like to ping Gary about making sure we share is subcontracting opportunities. Uh, and so uh, even, I know everybody wants to go big. Everybody wants the big contract. I get that. But sometimes a baby step, just get your foot in the door to kind of uh, uh, build those relationships, develop that contracting portfolio. I, I'd suggest taking a look at uh, the resources provided there for uh, potential subcontracting opportunities, and maybe you can't get a, uh, maybe a big contract isn't right for you right now, but maybe a subcontracting opportunity is. So as a suggestion, take a look at that resource there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dale. Yeah, there is so much information. Actually, it's the first Meet the Buyer event that I've had that someone provided that much information for my clients. Um, very in-depth, so many links, links within links, things that are not necessarily easy to find on their own. So we really appreciate you sending that.
So uh, in follow-up, then uh, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Any of you that are veterans, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I'd like to thank Washington River Protection Solutions, our sponsor for this event. And everyone that's here, I will send out not only the slide deck, which will include the contact information for our presenters, I will send that document that he's right, it's about 10, 10 pages of information you will want to put in your files, take time to go to those links, do your homework, be diligent, get that capability statement finalized, let us help you with anything. And with that, thank you everyone for being here. Um, it is such a pleasure and such an honor to have the VA working with us here at PTAC, and I look forward to another event similar to this, um, especially when we all get together face to face again when it's uh, when it's okay to do so. So, with that, thank you for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Stay safe and healthy out there, and we will talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm not sure if Amy's still there. She was kind of quiet. But Jeanette, thanks for taking a, a peek at that chat box and keeping me posted. No problem. And uh, I think so far, everything came through pretty well. Gary, yep. Jacob, thank you. And Talia, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Jody. This was great today. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jeanette and Jody. Appreciate it. And Jake as well. And Dale, if you're still on. Uh, great presentations. Uh, love the information. It was, uh, it was a good uh, process. Well, thank you, Gary. You put thank this you. baby all together. You did a heck of a job. We appreciate every single minute you were able to put in for this. Yeah, so. Jake helped out tremendously too. Uh, I think everybody, you've got a wonderful team that provided info that's going to answer a lot of questions, which is great. Thank you, everybody. With that, next I'll time. end it. Bye, guys. All right. all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll be in touch. Bye. Have a great day, guys. You too. Thanks, Jeanette.